interface so that we can start writing JavaScript and have it actually work inside our web page. And then, guys, we're going to have a look at some fundamentals of actual programming. So, namely, variables and data types. What is a variable and what is a data type? And how can we use them inside JavaScript? And then we'll be looking at modifying HTML content. We already learned how we can actually create HTML in Lesson 2, but now we want the HTML to change and uh, move around based on the user's input. So we're going to have a look and see how we can do that in that section. Finally, guys, we're going to finish off with functions, basically creating our own functions in order to help make our JavaScript more organized and more modular. But more information about that in that section. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and get started with the class itself. Our first topic, guys, of the day is the basics of JavaScript. So, guys, I'm going to redefine JavaScript once again. JavaScript is an object-oriented computer programming language, and it's commonly used to create interactive effects within web browsers. So JavaScript, guys, it's actually purpose-designed to interact with web pages inside a web browser. A quick question, though, before we get started with this section. What method in JavaScript can be used to output text to a HTML document? You don't know this yet, but you will by the end of this little demonstration that we're going to go ahead and get straight into for now. So what I'm going to do, guys, is open up my Notepad++ here. And as you can see, I already have a basic empty template, which is just raw HTML with absolutely no content inside of it. For now, I'm just going to fill in the title and say JavaScript Lesson 3. And that will be the title for our document. I've already saved the file, so now I'm just ready to go and start writing some actual JavaScript. You guys will recall, guys, from Lesson 2, that with CSS, there were three ways that we could add CSS to a HTML document. We could do it in line, which is to write it directly into a HTML element attribute using the style attribute. We could also add it internally by using the style HTML element. And finally, we could add it externally by linking a file using the link element inside the head of your document. Very similar things apply, guys, for JavaScript. We can also go inline, internal, or external. Now, ideally, everything that you write will be able to be externally linked. But just to demonstrate another mechanism to you guys for adding additional uh, programming languages to a HTML document, I will be using internal JavaScript uh, inclusion inside our document. So to do internal um, JavaScript, guys, we need to use the script HTML element, which is, of course, distinct from the style HTML element that's available for CSS. The script HTML element allows us to write JavaScript directly into a HTML document, and that is exactly what we will be doing for the remainder of this class. Note, guys, that in terms of positioning, I have put the script element near the bottom of the body. So all of my HTML will eventually go above the script element because I want the JavaScript to load last. I don't want it to load before the HTML has loaded because I'd like all of the HTML elements to load so that when I eventually go ahead and do the JavaScript, the HTML element will already exist for me to interact with. Just as a quick example, I can have a paragraph here and it says this is a paragraph and because uh, HTML and JavaScript are programming languages, the, this is a JavaScript gets loaded inside the browser before the actual JavaScript from the script HTML element. So, now that we've got the bare bones basics set up, guys, and I will tab out the script to keep things as neat as possible, don't forget that whenever you go inside a HTML element, you need to tab inwards, and whenever you finish a HTML element, you need to tab outwards or unindent your code. Okay, so I have a basic script here, and at the moment it does nothing, and it's not visible on the screen. If I save this, and I launch this inside my web browser, using the launch in Chrome, you'll notice that although this is a paragraph appears, the script HTML element does not appear. First of all, of course, there's actually nothing inside the script HTML element, but it is there, guys, and it will be able to add information to 
the document if I so wanted to. In fact, this will be the first thing that we learn how to do with JavaScript. We'll learn how to actually write information directly into a HTML document using JavaScript. To do this, guys, we need to use an inbuilt function, a function that already exists inside JavaScript automatically and by default. So we need to use the document.write function. To be absolutely clear, this is actually called a method, but I will go into more details about the similarities and differences between these two things uh, when it gets to the advanced course. For now, function, methods and functions you can consider to be synonymous with each other, and this is a function call, which means that I'm actually using a function that already exists. Finally, you'll notice the syntax that I'm using to write that line. First of all, I've got the name of the function. In this case, the name is document.write. Then, because it's a function, it's going to need to accept what's known as an argument. So all arguments will go between circular brackets after the name of the function. Finally, I need to end my statement with a semicolon because whenever you finish any statement in JavaScript, you need to end the statement with a semicolon. This is similar to when we were writing CSS. Every time we finished using a key value pair, we had to use a semicolon to end our statement. And in most programming languages in the world, guys, this is the exact same. The semicolon needs to appear at the end of every statement. Okay, so now that we've got the basic function written, we need to tell it what we actually want it to write. And to do that, we need to give it an argument. So the argument goes between the circular brackets, and in this case, it's just going to be a simple sentence. This is written by JavaScript. So if I now save this, guys, and go back to my uh, Internet Explorer, my Google Chrome, and refresh the page with the F5 key, you'll notice that this is written by JavaScript has actually appeared on the page because I asked JavaScript to write information directly into my HTML document, and I asked it to write it um, uh, using the document.write function. So that's the first function, guys, that we're going to want to use. Uh, additionally, you don't have to give it a string, which I'll be talking about later. You can give it anything, really, but we're going to go on to the next section so that we can see exactly what we can use this function to write out. Okay, so that's it. So uh, that's the basics of JavaScript, guys. What method in JavaScript, guys, can be used to output text to a HTML document? So does anyone know? I'd like to see you guys. There we go. Exactly right, guys. The bare bones basics is the document.write function. The majority of you guys have got it correct. You're absolutely right, guys. The document.write method is the correct method that can be used to output text to a HTML document. Okay, so our next topic, guys, is variables and data types. So these are two uh, very important words to know in programming. If you're new to programming, do pay attention because it is important. Of course, if you guys have some programming background, this will be relatively uh, knowledge that you've probably seen before. So for now, I'm going to define these two terms. A variable, guys. This is the Wikipedia definition, a storage location paired with an associated symbolic name, identifier, which contains some known or unknown quantity of information referred to as a value. Uh, this is a little bit too much for our needs, um, especially because we're studying JavaScript. So a simpler definition, one that I created, it's a stored piece of information, stored data, that can be changed. So you can store a piece of data inside a variable, and then you can change it whenever you like. Additional information on variables, guys, is a named container for storing values. So once you've actually created this container, you can always refer to whatever value was stored inside it by going ahead and finding the original name for that variable. You can set it to just about anything, guys. You can set it to a string, a number, an object, which we'll be covering later on as well. And finally, guys, if you want to create a variable inside JavaScript, you need to use the var keyword. The var keyword is a special reserved word in JavaScript. If a browser ever comes, comes across var, it will know that it needs to create a variable and store that information somewhere. Okay, so that's variables covered 
word for now. What about data types? Well, data types, guys, they are a piece of data with predefined characteristics. You'll notice me that I reference terms like string and number before. Well, that's because these are pieces of data with predefined characteristics. A string is a sequence of characters, numbers, and symbols. A number is exactly what it says on the tin, and you can do mathematics on the number data type, for example. Okay, so a quick question before I go ahead and demonstrate to you exactly uh, what a data type and variable are and how we can connect them together. On what data type in JavaScript can calculations be done? So do bear that question in mind, guys. We will be covering it in detail in the next section. All right, so quick demo, guys. We're going to return to Notepad++ now, and we're going to talk about the different kinds of data, as well as how we can create and store a variable. I'm just going to make a little bit more space here. Okay, so I can go ahead and name any kind of data type I like. So without using the document.write function, which we're going to leave there for now, I can go ahead and declare some strings and numbers and other kinds of data type. I'm going to talk about three data types in particular today. The first is a string. You can create a string, guys, by using quotation marks, and then inside the quotation marks, you can write any sequence of letters, um, numbers, so like 42, uh, and also you can write uh, any kind of symbols that you like. So I can go ahead and write exclamation mark or question mark, and I can even go ahead and add a smiley face as well, if I so choose. So all of these kinds of characters can go inside a string, and it's stored as a sequence of characters. You'll notice, though, that all I've done right now is gone ahead and created a string, and then that's it. I haven't actually done anything with that string. So what I'm going to do now is get rid of this string, and I'm actually just instead going to put it inside the document.write function so we can actually see the results of what we're doing. So I've gone ahead and replaced my former string with this new string. And if I save this and refresh the page, of course, it actually is able to write out that piece of data, which is a string. The next data type, guys, that I'd like to talk about is the number data type. As I've already mentioned, you can do calculations with the number data type. But how do you declare a number? Well, it's very easy to do this in JavaScript. All you have to do is write a number, and that's it. It will know that that's the number data type. Of course, again, there's no point in writing it without doing anything with that piece of data. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the quotation marks and get rid of that string. And I'm simply going to write out the number 5. If I save this, and then I refresh the page, the number 5, the number data type, is outputted to the screen. Of course, I've already mentioned that you can do calculations with this. So you can do calculations such as addition. So I can go 5 plus 3. And if I save this, I actually get the answer to 5 plus 3. I get 8 because this calculation is automatically done by the computer so that we don't have to do the hard maths arithmetic involved with doing that calculation ourselves. So you can do addition, guys. You can also do subtraction with the minus symbol. You can also do multiplication with the asterisk symbol. And finally, you can do division with the forward slash symbol. So you can do very complicated calculations like what is 50 divided by 4? Or let's make it even more complicated. Let's say what's 488 divided by 4? If I save this and I refresh the page, you actually get the answer 122, which is, I believe, correct. I'm not sure. Yes, it is. So there you go. Um, there are additional calculations that you can do, guys, using the number data type, but we won't go into any details about that for now. We'll cover it later on in the course as we get to it. Okay, the final data type that I wish to talk about today, guys, is the Boolean data type. The Boolean data type is very special because the Boolean data type can only be one of two things. It can either be true or it can be false. These are the only two options for Booleans. If 
I go ahead and document dot write the true value, and I save this and refresh the page, you'll get true is outputted. Of course, this seems to be pretty useless. Why do I need to know about the Boolean data type? Well, with the Boolean data type, guys, you can do what's known as comparisons. So instead of doing addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division like you would do with the number data type, you can go ahead and do a test. So for example, I can ask the computer, is 10 greater than 3? So I'm asking it a question now, and this is known as a comparison. Is 10 greater than 3? And if I refresh the page, we actually get the answer, true, which is telling us that 10 is greater than 3. What about if I ask it, is 10 less than 3? And if I save this and refresh the page, the answer is false. Boolean data types can be very useful, guys, once we get to using control systems in Lesson 6. But for now, it's good to know that they exist. We can do more kinds of comparisons than just greater than or less than. We can go ahead and say, is 10 exactly equal to 10? And by going equals equals, we're testing if what's on the left is equal to what's on the right. It's an important distinction, guys, that we must use two equal signs instead of one if you want to test for equality. We can also go ahead and ask it, is 10 less than or equal to 10? Is 10 greater than or equal to 10? And so on and so forth. Those are the basic comparisons that you can do, and you will see exactly why they are extremely useful in uh, Lesson 6 when we cover uh, programming fundamentals. Uh, okay. All right, so those are the three basic kinds of data types. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about variables again. As we know, guys, we can actually store information long-term inside JavaScript by declaring and using a variable. Again, we can go ahead and create a variable with the var keyword. So I'm just going to go ahead and say var my variable, which is the name that I've determined for my variable. So I've got my var keyword, I've got the name of my variable, and then I need to set it to be equal to some value. I can set it to be equal to anything. I can say it can be a string. So the number 42 is very interesting. It's going to be my string of the day. And then I need to end my statement with a semicolon. So what's actually happened here? Well, I've declared a variable, and the variable is called my var with a capital V. And I'm setting it equal to, with a single equal sign, guys, because I'm using an assignment instead of a comparison, and I'm setting it equal to this entire string. Well, what's the usefulness of that? Well, that means that now I can actually go ahead and ask for my var at any point after declaring it, and it'll actually know what my var is equal to. If I go ahead now and document.write my var instead of document.writing a string literal, I actually get whatever my var is equal to instead of actually getting the words my var. You can of course set a variable to be equal to just about anything, and this means I'm not only limited to strings, I could be also using numbers. So 3 times 6 divided by 2 plus 5, for example. If I go ahead and save this, and then refresh the page, I get the answer 14, which is the whole calculation stored inside that variable, and then once I write it out, it just gives me that variable, which is a number. Of course, I can store true or false values as well. I can ask, is 5 exactly equal to 5, and save it. And then if I refresh the page, I get the answer true, because of course 5 is equal to 5. Uh, so I will go back to the presentation, guys, and I'll ask you, on what data type in JavaScript can JavaScript calculations be done? So guys, absolutely, the number data type. Okay, so we're on to section 3 out of 4 now, guys. I want to talk about modifying HTML content. So this is how we can actually go ahead and interact with HTML that's already on a page and change it based on whatever number of factors that we like. But as always, I have a quick question to 
to ask you guys before we get into this particular section. So, which property of a HTML element object is used to get its content? So, uh, for most of you guys, you won't know the answer to this yet, but we will be covering it explicitly in this class. So, do pay attention and you'll get the answer to this. So guys, we've already looked at the document.write function, which lets us add content to HTML pages, but what about modifying content that's already inside the HTML document? Uh, I will be adding some paragraphs to my document later on, but let's just assume for now, guys, that in Notepad++ I have two paragraphs. I have this as a paragraph, I'm going to get rid of the script tag here, and I also have another paragraph saying this is paragraph two. And I'm going to end my paragraph here. So these are going to be the two paragraphs that I want to interact with. And so that I can specifically interact with this paragraph rather than both the paragraphs, I'm going to give this an ID of part two. You saw me giving a HTML an attribute of ID in lesson two with respect to CSS, but it's very important, guys, for us to be able to do it for JavaScript as well. We are going to be using two different functions in this course in order to select information from a HTML document and actually use it inside JavaScript. The first of these is the getElementsByTagName function. Now I know it looks like a very complicated function, but don't worry, I'll be explaining exactly what the process is. First of all, it targets the document of HTML using the document keyword which you've already seen. And then it tries to get all of the HTML elements on that document based on their tag name. And that's the dot get elements by tag name method. The name of the element it's looking for are then put inside quotation marks inside the brackets at the end of the function. In this case, we would be trying to target all of the paragraphs inside our document. And in the case of our current document, we get something that looks like this. We get the first paragraph, and then we get our second paragraph, which has the ID of part two as well. Now, the second function, and the function that we'll actually be using in this class, is the get element by ID method. This lets us target one specific element inside our document, and we can get it based on whatever ID it happens to have. So just like before, guys, it goes ahead and targets the document, and then it pulls the element, which has the ID of, using the get element by ID method, and then again, in quotation marks, we put in the name of the ID of that element. In this case, it's part two. So in this method call, guys, we would only get this paragraph given back to us, whereas, of course, with our first method, we actually got both paragraphs back at the same time. All right, so there is actually one more step required in order to get the text that's inside a HTML element, because up until this point, we've actually gotten what's known as the full markup of a HTML element. But we only need to add a little bit more code in this case. So again, guys, step one, we target the document of our where our JavaScript is located. Our second step is to get the element using its ID, and that is, of course, the get element by ID method, and the argument for that method is part two. Finally, step three is to get the content that's inside that element, and to do that, we need to use the dot inner HTML property. Now, this kind of functions a little bit like a variable, except that it's specifically related to a particular element. So, we can go ahead and get the dot inner HTML of any HTML element we want, as long as we've targeted it. Alright, so uh, that's it, and we're good to go, guys, in terms of modifying HTML content. But, of course, it's much easier when you see it actually in action. So, let's go ahead and go back to Notepad++ and get to work on targeting a HTML document. Alright, so as I said, guys, I want to, in this particular class, target this particular paragraph. So, how do I do that? Well, let's go ahead and use the document. Dot, once again, guys, get element by ID. And you'll notice, guys, that I'm capitalizing the beginning of element, the beginning of by, and the beginning of ID, because JavaScript is case sensitive. And then I need to go ahead and put in the argument to this method call, and I'm going to go ahead and say part two, because I want to get the paragraph which has an ID of part two. Now that I have the full markup of the HTML element, I want specifically the inner HTML, exactly what's between the two P HTML tags. So I go dot, and then inner 
guys, I've now taken the inner HTML of this paragraph. So, what am I going to do with it? Well, I guess I could go ahead and store that information inside a variable, saying par, par info. I could go ahead and store it in a variable called par info, and I can set it equal to that whole section. At the end of the day, this is just going to be what looks like a string that gets returned, and then I can store it inside this variable called par info. So just to demonstrate that this was all successful, I'm going to do one more thing here. I'm going to document.write par info. Oops, with a capital I, of course. And that means that what should happen, guys, is that you should see this is paragraph 2 written a second time inside our actual web browser. If I go ahead and refresh this page, you'll see that I've got this is a paragraph, this is paragraph 2, and then this is paragraph 2 written a second time. So just again, guys, to go over it uh, once more, what did I do? Well, I've got my basic HTML, and then I stored the inner HTML of uh, paragraph 2 inside a variable called par info, and then I went ahead and I printed it out to the HTML document a second time. So that's what, uh, that's basically how you can pull information from a HTML document. Uh, of course, this isn't particularly exciting, but we're going to be able to do more interesting things in a few moments once we've learned about functions. So guys, what property of the full markup of an element is used to get its contents? Very good. It is the .innerHTML property that we need to access in order to get the information inside a HTML document. And yes, to clarify, Gideon has said that it is a case-sensitive name, and you're absolutely right. The HTML, guys, it has to be capitalized inside that property name. All right, guys, so we've already actually seen some functions in action. So let's go ahead and actually define functions properly now. A function or a method is a pre-written set of instructions that may or may not return a value. The latter half of that you don't need to worry about for now. I'll be showing you guys the differences later on in Lesson 8. But functions, guys, they are a pre-written set of instructions. As you can see, we know that all we had to do was call the document.write function. All we had to do was call the document.getElementById function, and all of the actual work was done for us. We didn't need to know anything other than the function's name, and the work was done for us. But guys, when you're writing JavaScript, sometimes you're going to need to create your own functions, and we're going to have to see how exactly we can do that in this next section. Quick question, though, as always, before we get started. What is the difference, guys, between an argument and a parameter? It's a subtle but very important difference, guys, and we will be, of course, answering this question in the next section. All right, so, first things first, guys. A function, as you guys know, it is code that's designed to perform a specific task, because if you give it a pre-written set of instructions, it's going to be able to do exactly one thing. Second thing that's important to note, guys, is that it only runs when called. You'll notice that when I used the document.write function, then and only then did it write information out to the screen. But it's important to note, guys, that the document.write function is already in existence. It's already prepared. It just has to be used, and to use it, you need to call it. We can, of course, create our own functions, and we can create our own functions by using the function keyword. And this lets JavaScript know that we want to declare a function. So without further ado, guys, let's go ahead and get into the final section of this class, which is to create some functions and do some interesting stuff. This is going to be the longest section in this class, so uh, do be uh, patient with me while I get through it. All right, guys, so I'm going to get rid of everything for now, and what we're going to do is declare our first function. Uh, is there a list of pre-programmed functions available? If you want a full list of uh, information on JavaScript, I recommend going to the Mozilla Developer Network, and you'll get all the information on JavaScript functions that are already declared there. For now, though, guys, we're going to create our own function. To do that, as I mentioned, we need to use the function keyword. So this function, guys, will go ahead and let JavaScript know that we 
want to create or declare a function. So let's go ahead and declare a function, and I'm just going to keep it simple and call the function my funk. Then, guys, I'm going to have opening and closing circular brackets and opening and closing curly brackets. Now, quick note. These circular brackets are where we go ahead and list the parameters for this function. So any values that can be given to this function when it's created. And then we have our curly braces, which is where the actual steps to performing the function are going to go. So what are we going to do in this particular case? Well, let me just go ahead and make sure that I have my organization planned out okay before I forget to do anything, guys. Um, this function, guys, is going to go ahead and, for starters, do something very simple. So let's go ahead and just get it to go ahead and document.write. Uh, the function was called. So it's very basic, guys. This function has only got one line inside it. Of course, a function can have as many lines as it likes. In this case, it's as simple as possible. So I'm going to save this now, guys, and I'm going to refresh my page here. And you'll notice, guys, that that string was never actually written out to this, to this page. Does anyone know why this function never actually wrote information out to the page? I declared the function, but I never called it. So very good stuff, guys. I didn't call the function. So I've declared the function now, and now what I'm going to do is call it. So I'm just going to go ahead and say my func, and then end my statement. So to call the function, you have to call the name of the function, which in this case is my func, and then you have opening and closing circular brackets for any arguments that go in. In this case of this particular function, there are no arguments, so I can just leave it empty. So I'm going to save this now and refresh the page, and voila, guys, I do get the text. The function was called actually appearing on the page because the function was declared, and then I called the function, and then that function wrote out to the screen. All right, guys, so this function works. We've created our first function, but it's not particularly interesting. It's not doing anything exciting. It's not interacting with the user. So we're going to do that for the next five minutes in this class, is we're going to create some buttons for the user to actually interact with this function dynamically. So I'm going to have to introduce two new HTML elements to you guys for the purposes of this class, I, uh, for this section. I'm going to introduce you to the button HTML element. And this button is going to say, click me inside of it. And additionally, guys, I'm going to show you guys the input HTML element. And the input HTML element, guys, allows a user to add information to a particular HTML element using the web browser. So, for example, this input is going to have a HTML attribute of type equal to text, which means that the user can insert text inside this input box. And then if I save this and refresh the page, you'll see, guys, that I have a uh, an input box here and a button here. So I can go ahead and say, hello, I can type anything I like. Of course, this button doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't matter how many times I click it. It doesn't actually do anything right now. But that's the functionality that we can add with JavaScript. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to do it in the simplest way possible for now in this introduction course. The button is going to have an on-click attribute attached to it. So this means that whenever this button is clicked, I'm going to go ahead and call a function inside my JavaScript. So I can actually go ahead and directly write the name of the function inside the quotation marks for the on-click attribute. So in this case, on-click is equal to my func call. So instead of me having to actually manually type in my JavaScript, I can go ahead and actually um, get the button to trigger the function call itself. I'm going to briefly change this to, from document.write to document.getElementById. And the parameter for this argument is part2. And I'm actually, this time, instead of taking the information from inner HTML, I'm actually going to say that the inner HTML of this paragraph I'm actually going to change it to be equal to this was changed. This was changed by a function. So guys, as you know with the equal sign, what's on the left hand side gets changed to be equal to what's on the right hand.
left-hand side. So I'm actually doing the opposite to what I did earlier. This function is going to change what's actually inside this paragraph to be equal to this string here. So if I save this, guys, and I refresh the page, you'll notice that currently nothing is happening. But this is paragraph 2. Once I call the function by clicking this button, it'll say that this was changed by a function. And this is how you can get the user to start being able to interact with a web page by using things like buttons and functions inside JavaScript. Okay, so uh, that's basic, the basics of getting a button to call a function in JavaScript. But now let's take this one step further and get this user input box to actually be the determining factor of what this button does. So how do we do that? Well, this is going to require us to do some slightly more complicated things than we've been doing so far. At the moment, this function does one thing and one thing only. It's got one statement inside of it. So what am I going to do now? I will actually want them to get the input value and set paragraph 2 to be equal to that value instead. So I'm getting information from the user and then I'm going to be able to push it back out to the web page as well. So this is going to require a couple of things. First things first, I need to be able to target that input element. So I'm simply going to give it an ID of user input, which means that I can easily target it inside JavaScript. <coughs> okay, so once I've done that, I'm going to get rid of this whole sentence for now. And instead of, uh, I'm going to take things step by step, and then I'm going to explain the code as I go along. So the first thing I want this function to do when it's clicked, guys, I want it to get the information from this input box. So I'm going to go document dot get element by ID. Oops, by ID uh, user input. So I'm getting the input box uh, element. And guys, important difference between the input box and the button or a paragraph is that I'm not getting the inner HTML, guys. I'm getting the value of that input box. You'll notice that I didn't actually close this input element like this and have information inside here. The reason for this is because the input HTML element doesn't actually have any error HTML. Instead, what happens is that the value of the input box is what the user types into it. And you'll notice, of course, that it is blank by default. So to get that information from an input box, I need to access the dot value property of the input box rather than the inner HTML property. Okay, so now that I've gotten that piece of information, what do I want to do with it? Well, I'm going to want to be able to use it later on in this function, so I'm going to declare a variable called text, in text value. And I'm going to set it equal to that piece of information there. Once this is done, guys, I need to take the next step. What I'd like to do now is grab the paragraph, and I want to change the inner HTML of the paragraph and set it to be equal to the value of the input box. So let's do this. What I need to do is go document.getElement by ID, by ID, part2, and again, this time I want the inner HTML. Again, I want to set the inner HTML to be equal to something rather than pulling the information and storing it in JavaScript. So this time, I'm going to set the inner HTML of that particular paragraph to be equal to whatever the value of text value happens to be when this function is called. So go ahead and set it equal to text value. So guys, obviously this function is a little bit more complicated than what we've come across before. And you'll find that if you're building a web application, it can get very complicated very quickly if you're building complicated functions, and so on and so forth. So it's good practice, guys, in programming to do what's known as commenting your code. And this is adding non-programming words into your script in order to explain what you're doing. In JavaScript, to do that, there are two ways. You can either go forward slash forward slash and say this is a comment. Or alternatively, guys, you can go forward slash asterisk and say this is also a comment. And then you can end that comment with asterisk forward slash. The only difference between the two is that two forward slashes end on that line and then forward slash asterisk 
only ends when asterisk forward slash is spotted. So these are two ways of writing comments. So what does commenting your code do in terms of functionality? Well, if I refresh this page, you'll notice that the comment doesn't appear or doesn't change or affect the web page in any way. And that's the whole purpose of comments, guys, is that they're specifically directed at programmers who are actually trying to build the website. They're not for the user at all. So let's put this comment to good use. We're going to go ahead and say this stores the value of the input box to a variable. And that's it. And that means that the following line has now been explained using a comment. I can then go ahead and create a second comment for the line following and say this um, changes the inner HTML of part two to be equal to text value. And there we go, we've now explained two lines of code. Of course, functionally it's the exact same, but if you're ever working with another person on the same project, it pays dividends, guys, if you ever comment your code. It's very important, particularly when you're programming with something like JavaScript, which is more complicated than something like HTML would be. All right, guys, so that covers sort of creating interesting content using a function. There's one last thing that I'd like to cover, and that is, of course, creating arguments and parameters for a function. You'll remember, of course, that this get element by ID method actually accepts an argument, and same with the document.write uh, method that also accepts an argument. So how do you create a function that does the same thing? Well, inside the the circular brackets, when you're declaring a function, you can create what's known as a parameter. So these are going to be temporary variables that get created when the function is called, and then they're gone again once the function is finished. So for example, guys, what I could go ahead and do in here is uh, just go ahead and give the uh, input here, the user, the, the, uh, sorry guys, the, input here, instead of having to statically type user input, I can just go ahead and type in here, uh, for example, um, oh, sorry guys, the input ID. So this is going to be the name of my parameter for the duration of this function only. And this means a couple of things. Instead of going ahead and get element by ID and always having to change this function if I ever want to use it again, I can just go ahead and say input ID, and that means that no matter what happens when this function is called, it'll go ahead and pull the input ID. Now, when I call the function, all I have to do then is go ahead and give it uh, the actual name of the ID I want this button to be connected to. Of course, in this case, it's user input. So if I save this, refresh the page, and type hello, and click me, it will work as intended. I actually forgot to show you guys that this works as intended. This works, exclamation mark, and if I click me, it'll call the function again and change the paragraph to whatever I want it to do. So it's like, woohoo, uh, we'll go woohoo, and click me, and of course the paragraph will still change as intended. So sorry guys, I actually went a step too far before I demonstrated the functionality actually working, but uh, never mind. This is particularly useful, guys, to do what's known as modularizing your web application. So uh, it is an important tool to use to make it so that it's as easy as possible to make this function work in more than one scenario. So at the moment, it actually works for any input at all. All you have to do, of course, is put the name of that particular ID when you actually call the function, whereas before, it had to have an ID of user input. Now, this function it can actually be used in uh, multiple scenarios. I can actually use it uh, uh, for any file where I, have, where I want this functionality. All I have to do is give the ID when I call the function, actually. All right, guys, so that's gonna cover it for today. I'm going to quickly finish off the class here, guys. So, guys, what is the difference between an argument and a parameter? The difference is subtle, but it's very important. So, let's see what you guys think.
Uh, a parameter is a variable inside a method definition or a function definition or a function declaration even, whereas an argument, it's the data passed into a method or a function's parameters. So the argument is given to the function when the function is called, whereas the parameter, it actually just does something to that particular argument inside the function itself. The parameter is the variable that's used temporarily during the function. The argument is the value of that data that's passed into the parameters. All right, guys, so quick summary of today's class. We had JavaScript basics. We looked at variables and data types and the differences between the two. We also looked at how we can actually change HTML content using JavaScript's methods like getElementById or getElementById.